Can you raise a little bit the volume or some, uh, maybe I should raise the volume somehow. So, um, can you share? Can you me? hear me better now? Yeah, sure, sure, much better. Yes, yes. Can you share the screen? I have tried to. Did I not succeed? Whoops. Are you seeing uh, my first slide? No, no we don't. We just see you, Joel. Okay, that's not good enough. Just a moment. So what do I do here? Uh, there you go. That's just getting, let me just see. Well, let's, let's go back to the Zoom meeting. I see. I picked maybe at that. How do I get that there? How about now? No. Are you just seeing me, or are you are you seeing the screen? Uh, we are seeing uh, yes the screen with um, all participants. And uh, now yes yes, you share the screen. Now we see the slide. Slide two. Perfect. Now let me see if I can make it so that I can see my slide. Just a moment. Yes, we see slide two now. I see, okay, very good. Okay, now just get this out of the way. And go to slide one. Okay, so shall I begin? Yes, very good, thank you very much. Yes, please. Okay. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to join this meeting. And I'd like to thank the other speakers for fascinating presentations from very different disciplinary backgrounds and perspectives. I've learned a lot from the other speakers and from the questioners, and I'm grateful to be a participant in this meeting. I want to talk about the infinite variance of US COVID-19 cases and deaths and Taylor's law of heavy tailed data. The picture at the bottom of the screen shows where I am now in the Catskill Mountains, Northwest of New York City. I'm sorry not to be with you in Trieste, but I feel fortunate to be where I am. There are four parts to this talk. I want to introduce the concept of a variance function, then tell you about Taylor's law, then talk about heavy tails and regular variation, and bring all of these concepts together in the fourth part to talk about the distribution of COVID-19 cases and deaths in the United States. So we're on part one. Variance functions. What is a variance function? There's a mathematical definition and a practical definition. The mathematical definition, the population definition, given a non-empty family of random variables, that means quantities that you can measure, if each random variable has a finite mean and a finite variance, the population variance function is the mapping from the mean to the variance. How does the variance change when the mean changes? The sample variance function, suppose you have a set of samples of observations. How does the sample variance change as the sample mean changes? So one has to do with the underlying probability distributions. The sample variance function has to do with your observations. That's part one. Part two is what is Taylor's law? And this is a picture of Lionel Roy Taylor, who uh, was a, a British entomologist, and he was the last person to discover Taylor's law. It was discovered multiple times by other ecologists before him, 
He collected many examples and it was then named after him. Taylor's law says that if each random variable has a finite positive mean and variance, then there exists a coefficient A and an exponent B such that the variance equals the coefficient A times the mean raised to the power B. That's a power law. So sometimes Taylor's law is called Taylor's power law because the variance is a power of the mean. The sample Taylor's law holds if you have a samples with mean X bar and variance S squared, then the power law holds. And if you take the logarithm of the power law, the log of the sample variance is roughly equal to a constant log of A plus a slope B times the logarithm of the sample mean, or you can divide the sample variance by the sample mean raised to the B, and that's roughly constant. The difference between the population Taylor's law and the sample Taylor's law is crucial for this conversation. The difference is for the sample Taylor's law, the sample and the mean and the sample variance are always finite numbers, even when the underlying distribution has no mean or variance, or those are infinite. So your observations are finite, but the underlying law might be infinite. Here's the data structure for a Taylor's law. You have a set of samples, the columns, S equals one, S equals two, S equals three, and so on, a set of samples. In each sample, you have a set of observations, X11, X21, X31 for the first sample and similarly for the others. For each sample, you got a bunch of numbers. The number of numbers might be different from one sample to another. And for each sample, you can calculate a mean and you can calculate a variance. So you get a set of pairs of mean and variance. That is the data structure and you may have such data of your own. Let's illustrate that with tornadoes, which is part of human ecology. The United States has more tornadoes than any other country, according to Lloyd's of London. This is what a tornado looks like. Now, what does tornadoes have to do with Taylor's law? My colleagues, Michael Tippett and I, studied Taylor's law for tornadoes over the years 1954 to 2014. Each year has a sequence of tornadoes. We look at all the tornadoes and we group them into outbreaks. An outbreaks, outbreak is six or more consecutive tornadoes with not more than six hours between the start of one and the start of the next. So we take all the tornadoes and F1 plus means Fuji to scale one or higher. We only take credibly, uh, repeatedly observed tornadoes. We don't take, uh, you know, maybe I saw a tornado or not. So this is to reduce variability due to population density and um, make the data more credible. So for each year, we can look at the number of tornadoes per outbreak for all the outbreaks in that year. And we calculate the mean number of tornadoes per outbreak and the variance of the number of tornadoes per outbreak. So is an outbreak also uh, geographically close? It has to be in the United States, lower uh, 48 states. They can be anywhere. But in general, when there is a an outbreak, they are generally closely related because there's a storm system that is throwing off the tornadoes. But we did not impose a geographic constraint 
except that they are in the lower 48 states. And that's where a, a that's where there are more than any other elsewhere in the world. Although that's not the only place where they occur. So an outbreak is defined as at least six tornadoes starting not more than six hours apart. According to the insurance companies, 79% of tornado fatalities and most economic losses occurred in outbreaks. Why? If you have only one tornado, okay, it comes and goes. If you have two or three, the first one weakens the roof, the second one takes it off. There are no trends over the 60 years that we looked at in the number of reliably reported tornadoes and there are no trends in the number of outbreaks in the last half century. But the tornadoes are increasingly concentrated in outbreaks. The mean and the variance of the number of tornadoes per outbreak and the insured losses increased significantly in the last half century. And here's our paper from Nature Communications. The Panel A, number of tornado outbreaks per year, no significant trend. In fact, a slight, slight decrease, but no trend. However, panel B, the mean number of tornadoes per outbreak grew by 0.66% per year. And the variance of the number of tornadoes per outbreak grew by 2.89% per year roughly four times faster. On the right, in panel D, the number of tornadoes per outbreak, the vertical axis is the variance, the horizontal axis is the mean, and we have a power law. They are, both axes are on logarithmic scales. The mean raised to the power 4.33 is proportional to the number, the variance of the number of tornadoes per outbreak. So we have a power law relationship. Okay, that's an example. And the higher percentiles increased faster in this work with Chiara Lepore and Michael Tippett in science in 2016. On the left panel in panel A, the upper curve is the 80th percentile. And you can see that that 80th percentile is growing faster over this half century than the bottom line, the blue 20th percentile, which hardly grew at all. So the linear growth rate is plotted on the right, and you can see that the higher the percentile, the more extreme observations grew faster than the less extreme. Okay, we are now on to part three heavy tails and regular variation. Joel, can you, can you assign any meaning to the exponent? You mean the exponent 4.33? Yeah. We do not have a theory for that. That requires some physics and we're not there yet. Thank you. Good, good question. I wish I could answer it. Okay, heavy tails and regular variation. So let me tell you about a familiar distribution called the log normal distribution. There's a plot of the probability density function on the top right corner. A random variable with parameters mu and sigma squared is called log normal if the logarithm of that random variable is normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared. Okay, that's the definition. Your log normal if your logarithm is normal. Here is the formula for the mean, the expectation E, and here's the formula for the variance. And I hate to make people look at formulas, but in this case, just brace yourself. And if sigma squared, the variance parameter, is constant and only mu changes, look at the formulas. For the expectation, 
it's proportional to expo exponential of mu if the sigma squared is constant. And for the variance, it's proportional to exponential of two mu if the sigma squared is constant. So in this case, the variance changes as the square of the mean if the sigma squared is constant. And that's what I say in the last line. We'll need this fact later on when we're talking about COVID. If sigma squared is constant and only mu changes, then variance is proportional to the mean squared. That is Taylor's law with exponent two. Okay, I promise not to do more mathematics. Here is the Levy distribution. And again, the Levy distribution is named after the last person who discovered it. Levy discovered it in France in 1924, but Helmuth and Helmuth and Luroth discovered it about half a century earlier in Germany. If a random variable X is normal, then one over X squared has the Levy distribution. It's called a stable distribution with index a half. And there's the formula. And there I plotted the probability density function. And lo and behold, it sort of resembles the log normal distribution. Now we compare the Levy and the log normal. The data in these two plots is, are identical. However, the vertical axis on the left in the top is linear and the vertical axis of the probability density is logarithmic in the lower. And what you see is the blue Levy distribution tail in the lower picture is slightly higher than the red dotted log normal distribution tail in the lower picture. What that means is that the tail of the Levy falls slightly more slowly than the tail of the log normal. And the consequence of that slight difference in dropping off as X gets large is that while the log normal has a finite mean and variance, the Levy has an infinite mean and variance. Now, what does that mean for you and me? It means something dramatic. Here are simulations, which I did, of samples of increasing size from one, uh, two actually, to 10,000. The bottom red line is the cumulative average of a sample of increasing size for a log normal distribution with mu equals zero and sigma squared equals one. And as you can see, it converges to one and stays there. The blue lines, jagged broken fragments, are the sample cumulative sample averages from the Levy distribution, one over normal squared. And you can see it goes along for a sample size and then jumps up because some observation is extreme and yanks the whole cumulative average up. Then you get regular, you know, nice observations and the cumulative average drops down. Then another extreme happens and another and another and things drift toward infinity. In fact, at a rate proportional to the sample size. Here's another one. Things going along very nicely for the blue Levy curve. All of a sudden, after 7,400 observations, you get an extreme that yanks the sample average up to 14 times 10 to the fourth. That's um, 140,000 while the log normal red curve is going along very peacefully at one. My colleagues, Mark Brown and Victor de la Pena at Columbia 
proved in 2017 that even though the sample mean and the sample variance are infinite, they obey a power law. And here are some simulations. In the lower left corner, the, the horizontal axis is the logarithm of the sample mean. The vertical axis is the logarithm of the sample average, uh, sorry, a sample variance, excuse me. And one means a sample of size 10. And two along that diagonal line means a sample of size 100. Three is a sample of size 1,000. Six is a sample of size a million. Nine is a sample of size billion. And these points fall along a line of slope three, which we calculated theoretically. This is not fitted that that must be the slope. The general formula, if you have a stable law of index alpha, it obeys k minus alpha over one minus alpha. And that's true even when the observations are not independent, but are correlated 0 0.9999. And this is work by Richard Davis and Gennady Samorodnitsky, published in Proceedings of the Royal Society 2020. And it's true for the higher central moments, not just the mean and the variance, but for the central third moment, fourth moment, and fifth moment. Our simulations show this, our theorems prove it to be true. Many roads lead to Taylor's law. Many models yield Taylor's law exactly or asymptotically. The power law form and parameters do not determine how the test details. We're now at the last part, COVID. The New York Times okay. no, go ahead. publishes cumulative COVID-19. Hello? Y yes. Go ahead. go ahead. Can you hear me? Thank you. New York Times publishes COVID cases and deaths at the end of each day. When I downloaded the data in June, 2021, there were 1.4 million counts. And we arrange the data like this. We have one column per state. And for each state, we have the cumulative number of cases in each county in that state. And we have the cumulative number of deaths in each county in that state. And we can calculate the mean number of cases per county and the variance of the number of cases per county. Now, I used only the states that had at least one death or one case in at least seven counties. And the data conformed to Taylor's law. This is unpublished work, but I believe it's a new finding. There are 15 panels in this picture. They range from the 1st of April, 2020, then the 1st of May, 2020, across to the right, then the second line and the third line, 15 months up to the 1st of June, 2021, in the lower right corner. The horizontal axis on a logarithmic scale is the mean number of cases per county, and each X is one state. The vertical axis is the variance of the number of cases per county, and each X is one state. And the Xs fall along a line, that's the yellow line, and in the top left corner of each panel is my estimate of the slope of that line. And below that is the confidence interval for the slope. The red dash, dotted line below the data is what would be predicted from a Poisson distribution, that is a random, purely random distribution, Poisson, in which the variance equals 
the mean. So that's the line of slope one. The yellow line is a line of roughly slope two. Okay, so all of these 15 panels have the same coordinates. So you can see the data points moving from the lower left upward and to the right. By June 2021, all the data are in the upper right corner, but the slope is still two. That's the accumulation of the pandemic before the introduction of vaccines. This is the same plot for deaths. And again, Taylor's law holds, but the slope is three in April 2020, and then rapidly drops down to two and stays there. So this is cases, this is deaths. These are the parameters. The A coefficient, that is the intercept of that line, is steady around five. And the B coefficient is never distinct from two for cases over the 15 months. The same plot for deaths, you see the three in the lower panel on the left, and then it drops down to two. So the slope converges to two. To summarize this finding, Taylor's law describes counties cumulative cases and deaths. We lost you. The log variance increases linearly. The slope is, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I'm sorry, I'm in the mountains and the internet connection is not stable. The survival curve plots a probability that counts exceed X as a function of X. That's the definition of a survival curve. Show the video. Show the video. Gain some bandwidth for the audio. Maybe if you switch off your video, Joel thinks can be a bit or our video. No, this, no, this video. Yeah, yeah. that way it will improve bandwidth issues. You have more bandwidth. Um. Can I continue now? <clears throat> Can you turn off the camera? Okay. Yes, I will do that. One second. How do I do that? Just a second. I got to figure out how to do that. Turn, turn off the camera. Turn off the camera. I think I have to. Let's see. What else can I do here? Should be a camera Stop. down at the lower left of your screen. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Now you don't have to look at me. That's certainly an improvement. All right. Um, so here's what we did. The black, can you see this slide now? Please tell me if you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Perfect, good, okay. So let's take the K up in the top left corner. The solid black is the empirical survival curve of all roughly 3,200 counties in the United States of the number, the, the probability that the number of cases exceeds the quantity on the X axis. Both axes are on logarithmic scales. So you see that the black dots slowly come down. That means the probability that you're more than 100 cases is maybe 1% of the probability that you're less, greater than one case and it drops off. Then I fitted log normal distributions. That's the blue curve. And I fitted Weibull distributions. That's the dotted red curve. Well, the Weibull curve is no good. It's just too low. The log normal distribution fits pretty well for the first 99%. So the vertical axis, when it drops down to 10 to minus two, 10 to the minus two is 1%. So the, the log normal describes the data for the first 99% of counties, but it doesn't describe the last 1%. Now, if you look across all of these plots, that's a consistent pattern. Go down to June, 2021, the lower right corner, the Weibull's no good. 
the logarithmic log normal covers 99% or more, but the top 1% of cases are dropping more slowly than the log normal predicts. Same story for the deaths, okay? The log normal describes 99% of the distributions of cases and deaths. Well, if the count, why do we get a log normal? If the count has a log normal distribution, if the variance is constant and only the mean, only the mu, sorry, if sigma squared parameter is constant and only mu varies, then Taylor's law holds with slope two. So we look state by state, we fitted log normal distributions state by state and examined how does sigma, which is the square root of sigma squared, on the vertical axis change as mu changes. And what you see is that effectively sigma squared or sigma is constant compared to mu. So we that's for cases, same story, for deaths. So we have an explanation of why Taylor's law holds with slope two for the lower 99% of counts. The log normal distribution is what predicts that. But the very largest counts of cases and deaths are more extreme than the log normal distribution predicts. We zoom in to the counties with the highest 1% of counts. And this is the upper tail of only the highest 1% of counties. And we see again a straight, we see a, we see a straight survival curve. And we ask, this is for cases, and this is for deaths. And we fit a line to those data. And we ask, what's the slope? And in fact, here I'm using Hill estimates of the tail index for stable laws. And alpha is this quantity, the Hill tail index alpha, shown in red here. The number associated with each data point for each of the 15 months is the number of counties on which that's based, the number of counties in the top 1%. And the blue lines above and below are the confidence intervals from a thousand bootstrap resamples for each month. And what you see is that alpha is between one and two. That's for cases. And this is for deaths. And this is the same. Alpha is between one and two. The empirical survival curve suggests that the variance is infinite. Why? Because the estimated upper tail index alpha falls between one and two. A stable law with alpha between one and two has a finite mean, but an infinite variance. And when I came to this finding, my feeling was expressed by this painting from Bell in 1806, wonder fear and astonishment. What's going on? Well, I'm gonna to have to go fast here because of time, but regularly varying upper tail with an index alpha between one and two explains why Taylor's law with, B, with exponent two holds even for the largest counts where the log normal distribution fails. So we have, Two parts to the explanation. Log normal covers the lower 99%. Stable laws with alpha between one and two cover the top 1%. And to demonstrate, first I demonstrated this by doing some simulations. And then my colleagues who are a lot smarter than I am did the mathematics. And I'm gonna show you the simulations and just, you'll have to believe me or read the papers if you want to see the mathematics. I'm not going to inflict that upon you. I simulated four models of regularly varying upper tails based on the one over a normal random variable 
one over a uniform random variable, one over a product of uni two uniform random variables, and one over a product of three uniform random variables. And I used indices of one half, one, and three half. The upper lines are the survival curves, analogous to the survival curves that I showed you for the data. And the bottom three panels are the variance functions, and they all conform to Taylor's power law with slope two, or closer to slope two uh, as your sample size increases. There are uh, four different functions here with 100 samples of size 100 for each. And you can have correlations. The data aren't independent, and the models don't need to be independent. And I assure you in the lower right corner, yes, we have theorems. So what? Here is the bottom line from all of this analysis. If the variance of variances of cases and deaths per county are infinite, then facility and resource planning should prepare for unboundedly high counts. No single county, no single state, no single nation can prepare for unboundedly high counts. Cooperative exchanges of support should be planned cooperatively. Here are my math collaborators and teachers, Mark Brown, Victor de la Pena, Richard Davis, Gennady Samarodnitsky, and most recently, Chuan Fa Tang and Cheung Chi Yam. I've learned a lot from them and I'm grateful to them. Thank you for your attention. I welcome your questions. Thank you. Well, maybe I can ask a question. Uh, we have part uh, here is a question. Sure, this Thank is a question. Uh, brilliant talk. Thank you very much. Um, you talk about uniform distribution. Can you? Not that. Can you talk oh, sorry, yeah, because he's uh, here. Yeah. Your last, your last uh, slide, you referred to uniform distribution, and so then, what was the range that you took? Zero to one. Ah. Is this the slide that you were asking about, Partha? Sorry? Sorry? Is this the slide that you were asking? Is this what you were asking about? Yes, of course it is zero to one. OK, no. OK, good. You're looking at proportions, certainly. Good. So let, let, me, let me answer that in, in a little more detail. You take a uniform, you take a random number between zero and one. That's a uniform random variant. You take its absolute value, it's positive, okay? Then you take one over that and you raise that to the power one over alpha. Yeah, yeah, I got it. That's how you generate these things. And you can do this on your own home computer and see what it does for you. I have better things to do, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Uh, go ahead. Simon, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Uh, Joel, um, th thank you very much for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, it's always a, a good question when you have power laws is why you have power laws. And there are lots of ways you can get power laws. One of them is uh, through near second order phase transitions. You talked about earthquakes. You talked about outbreaks. Is there any connection there to these being near critical points? That's a good question, and I don't have a quick answer. I'm sorry, I'm slow. Yeah, uh, well, do you have any ideas to why power loss should be arising? Yes, I do. I have a definite idea about that. So the upper 1%, first of all, 
the spread of a disease is a multiplicative process. You know, I get infected, I infect a certain number of other people in the simplest possible world, which doesn't really exist. They each infect a certain number of other people and there's a cascade, a multiplicative cascade. Think of a branching process. But mm -hmm. of course the factors of propagation differ from one person to another. And the circumstances in which the infection is propagated differ. It's not only the individuals, it's not the, the, only the infection, the agent is different, the different variants and the circumstances crowding or not. Those multiplicative processes can generate a Pareto type distribution with a power law. And that is a well-known mathematical fact. I don't have to invent that. So <clears throat> it's the details of the multiplicative process that determine whether you get the log normal or the Pareto. But we know processes that are capable of the Pareto type survival function, multiplicative processes that could generate it. And those could be plausible models for transmission in states with very high number of cases and deaths per county. That, that, I think that's a sensible answer to your question. What do you Thank think, you. Cy? Does that no, I, I think I think I think that makes sense. Okay, and and I, I think it also may lead to some critical phenomena. So it, 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 um, there may be a secondary explanation there. Good, I'm with you. Okay. Can I ask a question? Please. Yes. So uh, just to connect this talk also to the rest of the of the of the workshop. The workshop is about you know, limits that exist in real physical systems and they're not captured by models. So here we have a, an empirical distribution and we have an analytic distribution. The empirical distribution uh, fits, uh, so the, uh, um, fits very well the analytical distribution or the other way around up to a certain scale, up to a certain uh, limit, right? Uh, but then there is a physical size, there is a physical, size, there, there is a physical limit on the empirical distribution that the, that is uh, not there with analytic uh, distribution. So we know that up to the scale that you were able to observe in COVID or uh, with, the, with, with, the, with storm. Um, so the, the sample has not yet reached the physical limit. And therefore uh, we can, I mean, it, it looks like uh, up to the, that scale, the analytic distribution is a very good fit. But, but uh, at bigger scale, so at bigger scale, if we, if, we, if we observe for longer time, or maybe we see that at some point the, 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 the sample, the empirical sample will be, will be cut, will be limited, will be truncated, will be truncated. And then at that point, uh, we would, uh, the math would be a bit different, right? So what I'm trying to say is that if you go back to, to the last slide, you say, in analytical distribution uh, of Levy, for instance, you have infinite mean, infinite variance, and therefore up unbounded process. But in the real system, you will always have some bound, some physical bound. The lesson that I take is that uh, probably we have not seen the maximum value, uh, but this does not mean that the maximum value does not exist, that, that, uh, that, 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 that the real distribution can be unbounded. So in some sense, this connects also to what we were discussing in the previous days. Sometimes uh, it's an artifact of the model that there is no bound, no limit, but, but it's just a model, right? <laughs> so perhaps the, the model will work only up to the scale where we have not experienced the limit, but we should yes. be careful yes. in, in reasoning about the model, uh, right? So maybe you can comment on that. Yes. I can tell you right now what is the limit of the upper the upper limit of the number of deaths from COVID. It's approximately eight billion, yes. which is the population of the Earth, yes. and that is a fact. But it does not provide useful guidance for how we respond to COVID now. And models have different purposes. The purpose here 
is to shed light on what is a useful strategy in planning for response to this and similar viral disease outbreaks, of which there will be more. So I accept the fact that there are limits that the models don't represent. They haven't appeared yet in the data, but the way the, the course of the event so far gives us some guidance that maybe we need to plan cooperative responses at the scale at which we experience the, the COVID pandemic. Does that make sense? Absolutely. In other words, I, I'm talking about what's now, not, you are absolutely right about a physical limit, but that doesn't bear on how we should behave now. Absolutely, I agree with the conclusion. It's just the term unbounded on physical system that looked a little bit uh, extreme. Simon? You raise your hand. I think Simon just forgot to lower his hand. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Joanne, for this uh, talk. Uh, if we develop uh, the the Tyler law, we find that the the B is the elasticity of the variance with respect to the mean. That's correct. As a, 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 a F, we have the same context of a phenomenon, the same phenomenon. If we, for example, introduce more control on this phenomenon, is more what? More, more what? I more what? I couldn't get the word. We have a market or a or machine. Is, is functioning. There is some relationship between the variance of the the length of a piece that is produced and the mean. And we have we control more the matching, the, the change, uh, the context of its functioning to control it. Do you think that uh, this elasticity will decrease or will increase? Join. I have to. Uh, uh, to, to explain more, please. I, I don't understand exactly what you're what you're proposing as the model. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I couldn't understand. Could you say it slowly, please? For the same phenomenon, if we uh, change the context and we find, for example, that uh, uh, B, the elasticity, is increasing or decreasing, what? Uh, type of conclusion can we draw? Okay, now I understand. Thank you. Um, that depends entirely on the details <clears throat> because you can get uh, an exponent or slope of two from a variety of models and um, you, there's a descriptive consequence. When the slope is less than two, it means that the coefficient of variation decreases as the mean increases. When the slope or exponent B is greater than two, it means that the coefficient of variation increases as the mean increases when the slope B equals two itself exactly, <clears throat> then the coefficient of variation is constant as the mean increases. The coefficient of variation is defined as the standard deviation divided by the mean. So it's a measure of variant of variation. You know, it's, it was one over the signal to noise ratio. But <clears throat> interpreting that mechanistically depends on the particular details of the content, uh, context. Okay. So Thanks for these questions. And if anybody wants to communicate with me, my email is cohen at rockefeller.edu and I'm happy to continue the conversation. Thanks so much.
We have another question. Please go ahead. <coughs> sure. Just a last question. Uh, I was working, I mean, I know the thing because I got yeah. you know, people who used to work in Public Health England, the UK HSA, working on this issue. So what the, what the government means, I mean, what the government cares about uh, is the basic reproduction number. It's so basically the growth yeah. of your epidemic. When the growth is above one, uh, something is under, it's out of control. When the basic reproduction number is below one, it's under control and you start relaxing uh, measures. So did you, did you think looking at the, the same relationship but for the basic reproduction number, using cases to look at R0 or R the T, R T, and look at the same thing? Because it's more or less the, the first derivative. It's not exactly the same quantity looking at. Because that's what they care about. That's what the government cares about. And one might ask, why does the government care about the basic reproduction number? And the answer is because epidemiologists have told the government that is a parameter you need to care about. That is a consequence of a theoretical perspective, not a given. In fact, what the government cares about is or at least what the people involved care about is how many people are getting sick and how many people are dying. The basic reproduction number scientists have told the government is a key to answering what will happen. But there are assumptions in relying on the basic reproduction number and those assumptions derive from the models in which that is an important parameter. I've tried to circumvent the conventional epidemiological theory by going directly to the counts, which themselves are unreliable, I admit. and to discover sort of positive model, such as the models that invoke a basic reproduction number. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can take a break and uh, reconvene at, uh, 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 Scott, is it okay if we take a half an hour break and uh, reconvene at uh, 10 past four? Of course. Yes, of course. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, thanks. Bye bye. See you all at uh, four past 10, at 10 past four. I need a talk.